a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Just like a people of God, we seek their footsteps once more. Through the day and night, the new Israelites we have been. young people, you have come to Santiago de Compostela, following in the footsteps Christian pilgrims from many different times and places. Here at the tomb of the Apostle Pete James, may you be renewed in the Catholic faith which comes to us from the Apostles in union with the entire Church. May you commit yourselves generously for Jesus Christ, who alone is the way, the truth, and the life. We came here because we love Christ, we love Catholicism, and we love our Pope, John Paul II. Some people who comes from um, the, all the Europe and uh, the world. Yes. Until, uh, we are one group we are in Europe. All the Catholics um, are Liban uh, Liban together. Liban and, uh, Lebanese, are Lebanese, Lebanese and uh, Russian, and uh, it is very. It's a big power. Very for us. because Holy Father is a father of all, all the people. I think it's very important encounter in, in the world. You understand? It's very. It's very. Mm, important for me in, in my life because I, I want to go to seminar, you understand? I want to be a priest. You know, there's a new civilization coming in for the year 2000. Uh, the Pope is talking about the decline of Western civilization, the decline of Europe, the decline of England, the decline of America, and uh, this is the hope. All of these people, they're all under 25, and they're here to see the leader of Christianity, which is the leader of civilization. August 1989. Young people from all over the world have gathered on the occasion of World Youth Day at Santiago de Compostela, the Spanish shrine and burial place of the Apostle St. James. A generation raised on a mass media promoted diet of fashions, sex, drugs and rock and roll music has turned up, half a million strong, to sit on the dirty, dusty hilltop of Monte de Gorzo outside this ancient pilgrim shrine for an encounter with the leader of Christianity, Pope John Paul II. At the threshold of the third millennium of Christianity, he has come to ask the young people to commit themselves in union with the entire church, to re-evangelizing the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ.
1,300 miles east, deep in the heart of mountainous Herzegovina, a peasant farming region in southern Yugoslavia, lies another hillside, strewn with rocks and wild bracken. It is referred to as the Hill of Apparition by those who climb up its rocky path to a flattened scar halfway. Here in the early weeks of August, young people gathered each morning to pray the rosary, along with this young local girl, Viska Ivankovic. Overlooking an ever-growing village, aptly named Medjugorje, for, as its Croatian name implies, it lies between two hills. The twin-towered village church, built in honor of the Apostle St. James, facing the larger hill, Mount Križevac, its summit crowned with a huge stone cross. Since the summer of 1981, when Viska and Ivan Dragicevic, along with four other village children, claim to have seen apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the slopes of the small hill, millions of people from all over the world have flocked to this fast-growing Marian shrine to witness the continuing daily presence of the Mother of God and to listen to the messages that she continues to give. Dear brothers and sisters, dear young friends, dear young fellows, I'm so happy that I can greet you all in a very particular way and from all my heart. And I'm so happy that every morning I can spend here some time together with you praying. I am here among you and with you, and from all my heart I want to give you the messages of Our Lady. Main messages of Our Lady are peace, peace, conversion, fasting and reconciliation. Our Lady is recommending to us all to pray every day the entire rosary, joyful, sorrowful and glorious mysteries. And she is also asking us to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays on bread and water. It was on this hill of apparition that at midnight on the Feast of the Assumption, August the 15th, 1988, the Blessed Virgin Mary made it known during an apparition to Ivan that she wished the following year to be dedicated as the Year of the Young People. Our Lady has realized that young people in the world are today in a very, very hard situation. And no doubt that this is the main reason why she has dedicated this year to young people. In a very special way, she has compassion for them. Expressing her concern and sorrow about the moral and spiritual plight of his generation, she made it known that she desired something to be done during this following year to help the young people of the world, particularly those who were far away from God, to once again find a role to play in the church her son, Jesus Christ, founded. Young people today are attacked from many things. Many are suffering from drug addictions, from alcohol problems. Many are suffering from the lack of morale. Now, almost one year later, at the close of this year dedicated to them, many young people have come to this shrine to hear what the Mother of God has to say to them through two of these young prophets and for a celebration of prayer and spiritual music to implore the Holy Spirit to descend anew upon all young people throughout the world. Is there anything deeper than that in life? Is there anything more important than, than sex and money and power? <laughs> is that what you're asking? <laughs> well, yeah, of course there is. I mean, that's why, if you look around, why there's half a million young people here who are like Father Bob was saying, are under 25. I mean, we're here to, we're here to, we're here to see Christ. And like Father Bob, I mean, we're the future. I mean, the whole world. I mean, you think about it, you say you're going through your everyday this and that and the other thing, you're working, you're going back on the subway doing this, fine. But I mean, we're the future, you know? I mean, everybody here. Well, he's in the year 2000. I mean, we're going to be running the show. You know, I mean, this is it. The third millennium. We're, I mean, the Pope's taking us into it. This is it. 
in my heart. I feel that that all of us, whether we want to express it or not, because we're embarrassed, because of peer pressure, or whatever it may be, I think that that all of us deep down inside have this are searching for something, and maybe they don't know that that something is Jesus Christ, but they're searching for something, and that's why they came. Que buscáis peregrinos? Esta pregunta nos la tenemos que hacer todos aquí. Sobre todo vosotros, queridos jóvenes, tenéis ahora la vida por delante. Os invito a decidir de forma definitiva la dirección de vuestro camino. Con las mismas palabras de Cristo os pregunto, ¿Qué buscáis? ¿Buscáis a Dios? We are gathered here to celebrate the assumption of our beloved Queen. Her heart is on fire with love for us, her pilgrim people. She asks us to fast and to pray to Christ her son. She asks us to say to him, thy will, not mine, be done. Her messages bring joy and hope of everlasting life. Her mighty intercession will end all strife. When Mary is our mother and Jesus is our friend, then we are heading for life without end. We will be happy, radiant and true. We will know victory and life at its best. We will know harmony in a kingdom of love prepared for us by God above. Thank you, Jesus, for your plan. Praise your Jesus, you're our man. Hallelujah. Today we'll be praying the glorious mysteries of the rosary. The first decade will be in English. The second decade will be in Spanish. The third in Vietnamese the fourth in Italian, and the fifth in English. We pray for all young people throughout the world that Mary may open up their hearts, may open up their minds to the messages of Medjugorje, that through the Holy Spirit may the fire of that love grow in each of us and all young people throughout the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I've worked over the last few years with thousands of young people. I've talked to them, I've shared with them, and I've seen a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. I knew of one young man, he went to the top of his stairs in his bedroom, and he shot himself in the chest. I knew of another young girl, she was a native girl. She was 12 years old. She took a gun, she put it to her head in front of her sister, and she said, I'll see you in hell, and she pulled the trigger and she killed herself. All over the world, young people are searching, and because of drugs, they, they think that's the answer, and they go that way, or they think it's sex. And now I believe God is very clearly speaking to the young people, and he's saying, come and learn from me. Come and follow me, Jesus is saying. And only when we follow Jesus, only when we give our whole life to him, can we find the answer, because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way, there is no other truth, and there is no other life. And I just believe that, that as the young people continue to search and continue to struggle, that they will come to the realization that the one thing that they haven't tried is God. And that's the message of Medjugorje. She's saying, try God, try your loving Father. Try it because it's the only thing that's going to work. It's the only thing that's going to get you out of the darkness, out of the fear, and out of the pain. The, the life and the beauty of the, of the time of your life is that you're coming to life and at the same time you're you, you, you're, the strength the strength you have is that you've got so much to look forward to and you're, you've got so much that you want to do there's idealism and so on and there's beauty and there's freshness and there's openness and there's love and there's excitement with life and feelings and new rivers of emotion and everything, all this tur that's going on, those, those beauties and strength at the same time are 
are a, a, a liability because amid all that enthusiasm and hope is a lack of wisdom, a lack of experience, a lack of, of learning where to, to turn off or where not to be open and so on. So I would like to say to young people, first of all, develop a personal relationship with Jesus and Mary because Jesus is this word of God that will, that will transcend your emotions. And we have to live by word, not by emotions. See, dogs and cats and animals have emotions, but God didn't program us by our emotions. He spoke to us. He wants to guide us by his word. And Jesus is that word. And to have a relationship with Mary, she is the mother of this word. One of the things that often put people right off the church I find at home is the fact that all those people going to church are either sort of square young people who sort of don't have much to say to themselves or old grannies whose husbands have died. And it's part of this image that turn young people totally away from the church and they think it's not something you do when you're young, it's something you do when you're old and you've got nothing better to do. And I think that's one of the lovely things you find here in Medjugorje is that God isn't for someone when you're old and you're about to die and you're going to have to suddenly think about Jesus. Jesus is someone that should be with you all the way through your life so you're more... Because with Jesus, your life is so much happier. It's, it's wonderful. And therefore, the youth need to respond and, and live in their church to, to encourage other young people to realise that it isn't something for, for odd bods or for old squareoids, old people who don't have anything better to do. It's something for now, and it's what's so beautiful about here in Medjugorje, is that everyone, whatever age, goes to Mass. I mean, they go every day, and they, they're proud of their faith. They don't hide it away in a cupboard and come to church every Sunday and say, oh, I'm, I'm just you know, going off for an hour, I'll be back in a bit. They're, they're open about their faith and they're willing to share it with others. And everyone wears rosaries around their necks. It's just beautiful. It's been fantastic for me being here because I'm here with a group of about 60 young people. And just to see the hunger in them, to see the transformation in their lives, I can't believe it. They're saying, we had young, one young man, he said to the priest who was with us, he said, Father, Father, we forgot to say grace before the meal. <laughs> you know, that's unbelievable to me. <laughs> you know, we have young people and they're saying, come on, we gotta pray, let's pray the rosary, let's, let's go, let's go up the mountain, let's pray tonight. And to me, that's fantastic. That's a sign, that's God working in our midst. And that's what the young people need to hear, that Jesus Christ is calling, that he is alive, that he is moving in this world today. And that's what Mary is here to tell. She's not pointing to herself, she's pointing to her son, Jesus, and she's saying, follow him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And I don't know if there's any young person out there and you're searching, you got pain in your life, you got drugs in your life, you're searching in the New Age movement anywhere else, I tell you, the answer is Jesus Christ. I've been through drugs, I've, I was in television, film, radio, none of that made me happy. I, I tried the New Age religion, in fact, I became a yoga teacher. None of that will fulfill you. The message of Medjugorje is true. God is alive. He is calling you, and if you follow him, he's going to give you joy, he's going to give you peace, and he's going to give you eternal life. Amadissimos jóvenes, un gran sector de la sociedad no acepta las enseñanzas de Cristo y, en consecuencia, toma otros derroteros el hedonismo, el divorcio, el aborto, el control de natalidad y los medios de contracepción. Estas formas de entender la vida están en claro contraste con la ley de Dios y las enseñanzas de la Iglesia. Seguir fielmente a Cristo quiere decir poner en práctica el mensaje evangélico que implica también 
la castidad, la defensa de la vida, así como la indisolubilidad del vínculo matrimonial. Que no es un mero contrato que se pueda romper arbitrariamente. Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. La paz. Ističe koliko je satona jaka da nas žele omesti u svemu. Our lady is also further on emphasizing that Satan is so powerfully present and that we should be firm in our prayers and pray more and more because it is only by the means of prayer that we can take him away and that we can keep him away from us. And the most powerful weapon against Satan, the best way to defeat him is with the rosary in your hand. When the Sabbath was over, Mary of Magdala, Mary, the mother of James and Solomon, bought spices with which to go and anoint him. It's, it's such a beautiful prayer. It's, it's so powerful. It really just fills you inside. You feel the Holy Spirit moving. You can feel the presence of Mary and Jesus just like next to you, with you, always guides and give. Which is very big. Had already been rolled back. I, I, had, I had something always inside my heart. Uh, at the age of, because I was Christian Catholic, I didn't understand nothing about religion, the church, nothing at all. And um, 17, 17 years of age, uh, I was going off the rocks. I uh, ended up in prison, in jail, when I was 17. That was a detention centre, and. Uh, I come out of there and all my friends was into heroin. I didn't know what heroin was all about. And uh, I started mixing with the wrong people. The temptation was there, taking the heroin, because I didn't know no one. So I got it. I had some. And I got addicted to it. Really bad. Badly addicted to it. And... Uh, all my friends was addicted to it. I started then. I started ripping people off. Six months later, I was. I was looking. I was virtually looking for eighty pound a day to keep me habit up. So we had to rob people, rob shops, rob cars, cassette radios, houses. Fair, everything, anything, and everything. Ripping people. Anything where there's money to be made. I went back to jail. And I've prayed in jail. I went to church every Sunday because it, it was there was nothing else to do in jail. That was the sense first what got got hold of me, what was saying to me. Well there's nothing else to do. Just go to church. Get out yourself. From being banged up for 23 hours a day. So I went to church and I didn't really feel anything. But I understand all about it now. I understand our Lord was there with me, looking over me. Because whilst I was in jail, whilst I was in jail, I had these dreams for nine days. Dreams about the demons coming for me and being that frightened. I was, I was that frightened. After the third night, I was that scared to go to go to sleep. I was that scared to go to sleep. Because it was like, if I was in the palm of the hand of the devil, if he was there and he had hold me like that, he had three fingers like that. He had three fingers like that. That was three years. And gradually I was getting bending those fingers back. 
till eventually, after 18 months, till I come to Mizigori, those fingers is open now, and I've just walked off his palm of his hand, holding glory, and being free, being free of everything. And uh, I come to Medjugorje in the sense of, I was looking for beaches. Even last week, I was in nightclubs, taking ecstasy, taking acid, taking rush, smoking pot, being a party boy, being with all girls, it's one, two girls in night. And Just firstly, just being like really bad now, man. Yeah. And I, I didn't understand it till I come to Medjugorje. I come to Medjugorje in the sense, I was looking for beaches, the sun, and I found much more than that. I found myself, I found myself as a person, I found my heart. I'd, I'd like to come here every day. I'd like to live here. I'd like, because there's so much happiness here. I was up on the hill, the small hill. On Monday, I come. I arrived on the Sunday. I come up on the Monday to the hill, and I didn't feel nothing. I was still the same ragged person, not caring about anyone's feelings. And uh, there was so much atmosphere there. I didn't understand nothing. I mean, I was just looking around saying, look at all these holy people and what are they doing this for and that. Then suddenly, like if it was overnight, something happened to me. Like if our lady touched me. I said, come, I understand. I've got the keys to your heart. Let me open your heart. So I met our lady halfway, and she was there waiting for me. Our lady says that she would be in a very special way pleased if we can renew the prayer in our families, children praying together with their parents and parents to praying together with their children. In this way, Satan would never be able to attack us. The most important thing uh, to do with prayer in the family is you gotta start, uh, like I have, I have two little brothers and uh, they, you, you have to start and you have to teach them what prayer really is and, and who God is and who Mary is and, and you know, about heaven and everything because uh, when you're, when, it's too late when you're, well, okay, it's not too late, but when you become, when you become a teenager, um, things around you are a lot harder. Uh, you seem like, or per personally, I can't speak for anybody else, but personally, I felt like drawn to like violence and sex and all this like drugs and stuff I didn't I didn't really get into it but but you, you it's kind of it's more intense at that moment just because all the things you're going through and you got to start with them when they're young and, and continue it on and my parents um we used to pray a lot and sort of big family just four kids and when when we stopped praying um, I noticed I I couldn't relate to my parents anymore um, my dad and mom would fight a whole lot more. Eventually, they got divorced a couple years ago, and uh, my little brother kind of flipped out. And when after after uh, after the divorce, I felt uh, you know really weird, and I I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want anybody to love me or get close to me because I was afraid uh, that that I would that that I wouldn't be uh, able to get close to the people, and that they, once I got close, they'd leave me. We found that. In praying together, we'd often go down the stairs and say, oh, we don't want to do this, but we'd all gather in the living room. And the more we did it, the closer we got. And we'd always leave with a better feeling of, we just prayed. And 
not not just the fact that we prayed, but more of a closeness with God and Mary, and especially with praying the rosary, just closer together as a family. And it's a gift that she gave us for maybe being able to pray together. I'd just like to say to uh, all young people out there to beware the temptations of Satan in the world today. I mean, it gets in everywhere. Your family, your friends, your music, especially music. I mean, I'm into very heavy metal, I suppose you could call it. And the biggest danger, along with your friends there, is drink and drug abuse is, is rife at concerts, etc. And beware, this is how um, the, the Satan gets at children today. And even if he cannot get to you directly through drug abuse, he'll get through it indirectly. Because I, I come through from a very broken family, from not a very religious family, and it's broken by alcohol abuse. And this can break your religion. And you need to just stick in there and just, just pray, pray to God. excuses for all the evil things that I did. There was always an excuse. The first time I went to confession, it was like it was a great bed lifted off my shoulders. I have beautiful experiences with young people in confession. It, uh, even though I'm almost 60 years old, they seem to pop, but they just love it. If they have if, if they get a good chance to confess, they're so happy, they'll just reach out and give you a big hug because they somehow they know something good and wonderful is happening to them. And it's based on, on this reality, I think, that, that, see, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, since that's how he defeats Satan, he said, wonderful word, he said, I'm going to, now the prince of this world is driven out. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will cast out Satan and draw all to myself. The confession is Jesus fulfilling that promise. He, the Lamb of God who takes away their sins, therefore casts out Satan's power and draws these young people to himself. Now to do that, we have to let Jesus take away sin. I really wanted to go as soon as I got here, but I put it off for about three or four days and I was sort of saying, oh, it's not that important. It's more important to go up the mountain. But I knew it was really important. And um, I sort of sat outside the confession bit and um, I thought, oh, I can't go now. It's nearly four o'clock. I've got to go to that talk and things like that. And in the end, I was literally sort of, I don't know, I must have been led there by the Holy Spirit because sort of I was waiting in the queue and the priest got up to go and someone just said, right, go on, you're next. And I thought, like, oh no. And I was there and I had to sort of say it and the priest, he was really nice and he came from New York, so I thought, oh, at least I'll never ever see him again. <laughs> I'd go to confession. I'm very frightened of confession myself. I'd go, but I would tell half confessions. No, no, you tell the ones that you thought were something scary. <laughs> so I came to Medjugorje and I, my priest knows I'm frightened. From my past priest knows I'm fighting for confession. And I came to Medjugorje, and for the first two days, nothing was happening for me. So I decided I'd go and go and see, reconcile with the Lord. And I went and I went to confession, and now everything's great. <laughs> inner peace. You can't have inner peace without confessing your sins to the Lord. He just lifts everything off you. I told him everything, and um... I sort of had such a sort of real feeling of relief. I was just crying and crying, and um, I came away and I was, you know, really happy. Confession is naming and claiming. Well, I, 
I, was, I went with this boy or girl four years, and we had relations once a month, we, once a week, weekends, da-da-da-da-da. Okay, fine, that's all. It just means the name of the sin and a pattern of frequency. Otherwise, if that's sloughed over, if that's just ignored, or if somebody tries to be nice to them and say, oh, no, no, it's okay, you don't have to confess, they don't really get free. But when they get free, if, you, if, you, if a priest really lets, lets himself be with Jesus as the Lamb of God to take away the sin, oh, they're all so happy. They respond immediately. They just feel a light load. They feel immediately gone. And you can tell so many ways, too, that people who have admitted sin and called it confession and didn't get it hauled out, they come back and the things still bother them and it's almost invariably they'll come back because something still bothers them because somebody didn't help them take it away. And I went through the real deep sins of my life where I'd been really been hurt, you know, emotionally and so on. And I really talked about those. And when I, when I stood up, I just felt a whole weight had just been lifted from me that I'd been carrying. And I thought I'd been confessing. I never really had been. And for the first time, because I'd actually specifically named them and remembered them as much as I possibly could, they had just been lifted away from me. And I walked up and my heart just felt so light. And now I know that I can leave them behind me. I don't have to be afraid of them anymore bothering me. Now, Satan is really clever in this. He wants you to keep your secrets. So one big thing is don't, don't hold any secrets. Get rid of your secrets. People have got this, the, the, these burdensome secrets. The secrets are deadly. Secrets are those areas that keep you burdened down and the things that he doesn't want you to do. In other words, don't get your sin out and let Jesus take it away. Uh, that's the whole problem with young people. They say, well, I, I don't like to go to a confession. I don't like to talk to a priest. That's just Satan's trap to get you to keep your sin. Keeping secrets, you're kidding yourself. You're cheating yourself. Ah, this great awareness of Jesus' unconditional love. Uh, and when he says, when he says, gee, you know, I said everything I did, and, you know, and, the, and he's still nice, you know, and he still loves me. Ah, that's part of the grace. That's part of the whole, the joy of the freedom of confession. Maybe that's how to describe it, it's God's love, but I just feel peace. It's you know, as if I'm clean. I always walked about said that thing. Back at home. I couldn't say my deep, you know, secrets that I kept. In here, it just came real easily. But she says, confession does not mean only to list our sins, but it means after the confession, after we have been forgiven and purified, to change our lives. Now I'm realizing more that I'm here, more just how we are the temple of God, and how much he's done for us, and what we're supposed to be standing up as Catholics and what we believe and how we can't just stand up for half and say, yes, I am a Catholic, but to this extent, I'll, I'll do this and I'll pray and I'll go to church on Sundays, but when it comes to sex, well, it's okay. But I've realized that it's not because of all the sacrifices that Jesus has done for us. We can sacrifice a little bit. And if you are or if one is in love with another, then you can wait and it would last. And if you're really supposed to get married, if, if that's what's in the plan, then you could wait and it would only be that much more special and it would be a gift and there would be more respect in the relationship and you would know that the relationship is real and not just physical. And I've realized more so how much I've hurt God in just my lack of respect and always suggesting, oh well, I'll go to confession and he'll forgive me. Or in this case, I really love this person and I know that 
everything will work out fine. I'll, I'll always be forgiven because God always forgives. But there's a line for everything and there's only so much we can push. And we have to realize that if we want to receive anything, there always has to be giving. And there always has to be sacrifice the same way he sacrificed for us. Mass was something that you had to do every Sunday. And it was like if you lived at your parents' house, you have to go to Mass. That was the one rule that you had. And um, I used to make up the most the stupidest excuses not to go to Mass just because I didn't want to be there for that hour because I had other things that maybe I'd want to do. And now coming here, Mass is so fun and so neat. And just driving past the church, I just like want to go in there now. And I want to stop and pray and I want to to be part of everything that's going on. I think listening is the most important part because I dreaded going to Mass because usually it was really boring or I didn't like the music or it just didn't appeal to me. But I think if you try to listen and you learn from the priest, there's always something in Mass that you can benefit from and that connects to you. And um, I think that's what I learned here, especially listening to, um, to the youth Masses that we had this week. We just did a Harris poll in America about the religious state of the United States. And America is one of the top countries for, for church going. We're only beaten by Poland. In the United States, it said 95% of the Americans believe in God. Isn't that good news? Only 40% go to church. Even in Rome, where the Holy Father is. 20% go to Mass. You think the world needs conversion? You think the world needs prophets? You think we need to be challenged? That's why Mary's here. Like a Joan of Athens, she's saying, repent, convert, believe. Aside from our own personal intentions, let us also truly offer this Mass for the intentions of our Blessed Mother Mary. And for those that are still getting high on this material world and drugs and alcohol, but we just pray that they get high on Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate high. Let us pray to the Lord. I would like to pray for all of those in the world who are suffering from AIDS, from all mental illness, those who are without friends, and those who are rejected by their peers. We pray for an end to abortion, an end to suicide, an end to practice of the occult, all of these things which lead to death. We pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, the spirit of truth, the spirit of prayer. Lord, hear my prayer. In a very special way, Our Lady is recommending to us Holy Mass. She says that it is the most holy and the most important moment of our Christian life because it is then Jesus alive, living Jesus coming to meet us. And Our Lady wants us to prepare ourselves for the Holy Mass in a dignified way. A beber aquel, aquel cariz, estáis dispuestos a dejarlos penetrar por el cuerpo y sangre de Cristo para morir al hombre viejo que hay en nosotros y resucitar con él. Sentís la fuerza del Señor 
para haceros cargo de vuestros sacrificios, sufrimientos y cruces que pesan sobre los jóvenes desorientados acerca del sentido de la vida, manipulados por el poder, desocupados, hambrientes, sumergidos en la droga y la violencia, esclavos del erotismo que se propaga por doquier. Sabe que el yugo de Cristo es suave. Twelve hundred years after the birth of Christ, the church was in really, really rough shape. Things were going wrong in just about every situation. The hierarchy were in all kinds of trouble. There were scandals going on. And God raised up a young man. His name was Francis of Assisi. And he said to that young man, he said, rebuild my church. And I believe strongly from the core of my being that God's call to the young people today is the same call that he gave to St. Francis, that he's saying, rebuild my church for it's falling down. All around us we see trouble, we see young people, they go to church, they're bored out of their trees a lot of the time. And that's because they need to take their rightful role God is calling the young people. It is the young people who will renew the church. It is the young people who will be raised up to begin restoring the church. The big thing to do right now is start finding people that you can pray with. Form prayer groups. It's the greatest thing in the world. Of all the wonderful things that have happened to me since I've been in Medjugorje and all that, so much of it has come out of the learning and the shared fellowship experience that I found in prayer groups, and particularly among the youth because youthful people just have a power that God gives us. I mean, there's a, a certain special grace that's granted to the youth. And, and no matter what we've done or whatever, if we come together and we've gone through the confession and all that, I mean, being part of a prayer group is just extremely powerful. And, and you can rely on the other people in your group, you know, the birds of a feather thing, that's from the Bible. So, so get in there, get, find people that you can group with and pray and do it together and pray about a common goal. You know, if there's something going on in school or something like that that needs to be changed. Uh, I've heard groups in my hometown, uh, one of the schools has a problem with drugs and everybody got together and prayed about it and, and it started to lessen. And there was a problem in another school about satanic worship or whatever and a bunch of people got together and started to do a Friday night vigil where they would pray on Friday nights. These are just junior high school kids and high school kids. And eventually the people that were into the satanic worship started hanging out and coming to these things and a lot of them have been converted. So those kind of prayer groups are extremely important. The visionaries here have prayer groups, you know, with the youth in the, in the village. So take that example, take it back with you. I'm convinced that every time we go out, I've, I've done parish missions, I've done youth retreat work, people always say, oh, it's so good to see young people. Oh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> and that's because, like our brother said over there, that there's a special grace he puts upon young people. And if we are not the ones who hear the call of Jesus and answer it, I don't know who's gonna do it. Who are the future missionaries to the world? You know, I work as a missionary. I could use a hundred of you right now. I could put you to work right now in missionary work. We're retreating all over the North Country in Canada, and I've heard similar stories in the United States. There is work to be done in the vineyard, and it's to the young people that God is pleading, that he is saying, come and follow my son Jesus. Come and rebuild the church, for God wants to make a glorious church. You know that's true. You can feel it in your bones. That's the message of Mary. But even in a time of great darkness, the candle will burn all the brighter. The light will shine all the more. And I guess in closing, I just want to say, Jesus said these words. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Therefore, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Rebuild the church with living stones, and you are those living stones. Dear young people, I thank you for being here 
and for taking part in this great experience of prayer and friendship in Christ. I ask you to be witnesses to all whom you meet of the love of God and the faith that we have shared. I think um, it can hardly fail to be a spiritual experience, um, uh, seeing the Holy Father um, surrounded by the youth of the world uh, in, in mass, 600,000 people or so attending on a hillside, um, and all being called to evangelization, which is um, uh, a serious um, matter, and um, uh, young people seem to be responding to a serious uh, profound call. Um, in this, and understanding John Paul's uh, placing of this matter uh, historically as we approach the second part of the, uh, the, the, the end of the second century of Christianity, the second millennium of Christianity. I think what touched me most was, was what the Pope said about serving. He, he told us to serve and to love one another and that we can find that love through Christ and all of these people gathered here for that one purpose or for other purposes that they, were, that they were looking for. They were looking for Jesus. And the message that the Pope gave us was to serve, and to serve through, through, finding, through finding Christ in love and through our faith. I'm not Catholic, and I'm not particularly religious, but I came, and I'm re I think it's really good. Um, I'm Anglican, but I think that maybe when I go home, I'm going to start going to Catholic Mass, because here I've been going to the Mass, and it's incredible. You get a wonderful feeling, because everybody's coming together, all the different countries, everybody joins together, and nobody minds who you are, what you look like, how old you are, and it's just lots of young people. There's an incredible atmosphere. I mean, I've had a brilliant time doing this, and a lot of people would mock it and say, oh, you don't want to do a pilgrimage, it's stupid, it's religion. But it's been absolutely brilliant fun. I've had more fun than I would going to a nightclub, sort of underage or anything like that. The same as Vitska, I would say at the end that uh, I'm going to recommend you today and these days to Our Lady during her, her apparitions and that you should open your heart, not only during the apparition, but you should open your heart during this time that you are here in Medjugorje. We are going to recommend all your needs and all your intentions, but it is open that you open yourselves so that you can receive the grace of the presence of Our Lady and Jesus here in Medjugorje. And one thing that I would like to say at the end, these are words of Ivan, but I agree, you should not spend time in restaurants drinking beer in the evening. My brother, he, he taught me, like, because the way he was as a person and that, he was a bit of a rebel and that. And like, he wanted me to be that way and that. And he taught me a hell of a lot how to take care of myself. And this lad here, he is an hard lad and that. And if it can change him, it'll change anybody. Please me, yeah. Last year I went to Medjugorje also. I didn't believe in anything. But after a year from coming back from the, from the States and coming back here, I've noticed that the most powerful thing on earth is prayer. And that our energy is from the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's one of the most powerful weapon that the Holy Spirit can use on earth is the youth because we we attract so much attention people our age will listen to us the older people our parents our grandparents they'll stop and see what's going on why is my son or grandson changed or granddaughter or daughter changed our brothers and sisters will look and say that's not the same person I know. What happened to you? And when they see that joy, when they see that joy that you show and that you live, 
then they'll say, well, they know something. And they're going to come and ask you. People are going to ask you, what happened? And that's when you tell them your story. Tell them the love of Jesus. Tell them how the Spirit is alive. Because without it, without the youth, our church can die off. But that's why the Holy Spirit's coming upon us now, today. He doesn't want people here to die and live in despair. He wants us to live in joy. So before you leave here, Medjugorje, just remember, it doesn't stop here. Talk to your friends about it, because the Spirit's alive all over. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me with.